Good evening, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to the first episode of my Kerblay Space Program tutorial series. This is going to be going over the basics, so if you understand how to do command pods and you know which ones you like and the buttons and things of that nature, skip to episode two. Now, we're going to start a game here. I'm assuming you're going to know how to go into the settings and edit things if you don't like how they are. And we're going to just do some tutorials here. Now we're going to start with the vehicle assembly building. This is where you will go to construct rockets. And we have a selection of different control modules to use. The first control module and the second one, the Mark 1 and the Mark 2 cockpits, are designed mostly for aircraft. If you are sitting in the cockpit as the Kerbal, you can actually see outside, see what's going on and control it from there if you so wish. The other ones, it's gonna be significantly more difficult because if you're in the cockpit, you're controlling with the nav ball. And it's a little hard to land when you can't see the ground. We've got the Mark III cockpit, which is kind of a combination of a plane cockpit and a space cockpit. It is a little bit better when you're on the inside with view, but again, it's really not good. It's more designed to go into space than anything else. We've also got the Mark 1-2 and the Command Pod Mark 1. The 1-2 is basically a bigger version of the Mark 1. It has a lot more impact tolerance, so it's a lot more sturdy. It will survive a much harder crash, but it also weighs a lot more, although it can carry three Kerbals versus the Command Pod Mark 1's one Kerbal. However, its light weight can come in handy in certain situations. We've also got the Mark II Lander Can, which is capable of two crew, but it is absolutely delicate when it comes to impacts, despite its size. We also have the remote control versions. They are basically robots. You need to ensure that your craft has electric charge for these to function, because if it runs out, you lose control. That's just how it is. We've got several of them. They're all quite tiny, very lightweight, and very lacking in decent SAS controls, so you'll have to add that yourself, but we'll talk about how that works later. Next, we've got symmetry and snap to angles. These are bound to X and C buttons, respectively. You can also left-click on symmetry and right-click on it to increase and decrease it, respectively, as well as angle snap, left-click just toggles, right-click will as well. Now, if we have a fuel tank here and we're holding onto it with the mouse, we're gonna attach it to our craft. We can push the X button to increase the symmetry and that will allow us to symmetrically place two fuel tanks at the same time, or three, four, six, or eight, depending on what it is that we wish to do. You can see it blinking out there a little bit. That's a bit of a graphical glitch, but it's doing that because it can't place them. There is not enough room. It can do the six, the six will fit, but the eight will not. Now we've also got snap to angles. As you can see, if I move the mouse even a little bit, the fuel tanks switch around and they move and they, they're gonna be, they're a little bit jumpy. They can, they can go up and down a little bit and this has to do with the way that the game physics work. Not to worry, but if you put the snap to angles on, it will attempt to put the parts as close as possible to the nearest angle. I believe 10 degrees is the increments it works in, either 10 or 15. Uh, but with that, we can very easily create a craft that is quite symmetrical and looks pretty, like so, nice and even. Up next, we have SAS, RCS, and Fuel. To start with, we have the Advanced SAS module. The Advanced SAS module interfaces with things like fins and engines that have gimbling on them, and I'll go over what that is in a moment and utilizes them to attempt to keep the craft on the straight and narrow if you have the SAS engaged. There are a few things under aerodynamic that are also affected by this. You have the canards as well as the advanced canard and the uh, standard control surface as well as the small control surface. These all have the ability to move and direct airflow. So those will work and will attempt to keep your craft straight with the advanced SAS module engaged while you're in the atmosphere. But once you get up into space, they do absolutely nothing. Now, as for the propulsion side, occasionally when you look at an engine, you will see thrust vectoring enabled, and then you will see a vectoring range. 
If thrust vectoring is enabled, that means that if an SAS is engaged, or when you apply manual controls, it will attempt to use the engines to correct your direction of travel. The engine is actually capable of tilting a little bit to one direction. The amount of which it is able to tilt is determined by the vectoring range. Uh, a lot of engines are capable of one. However, there are a few that are capable of slightly more vectoring, like the Poodle engine, which is a smaller version of the really big full meter tank here, or, the, or three meter fuel tank engine. Uh, is capable of a lot of gimbal, so it is very maneuverable, even though it is a small engine that has very little thrust. Next, we have the regular SAS module here. The regular SAS module comes in just the small size, or just the, a regular size, just the uh, one meter version. There is a three meter version for those of you who want an SAS module for the larger fuel tanks, if you so desire. And the SAS module, or the Sickness Avoidance Solution, whatever you want to call it, there's quite a few names for this thing. Basically, its primary function is to prevent spin. Your craft will spin less when you have an SAS module on it and it is engaged because it's going to simply try and fight the spin. It will try to keep your craft upright as well. However, it does not have a great amount of force that it can apply to do so, so I do not recommend depending on it. You're going to want to either use an advanced SAS system as well as some fins and some gimbling engines, or you're going to want to use manual controls. We've also got RCS. The RCS is simply thrusters that go on the side of your vehicle and can correct its direction of travel to a certain extent. These are less useful in the atmosphere and much more useful when you're in space because in space you can't control it using the fins. So you have to use either an SAS module, which can take a really long time depending on how big your craft is, or the RCS module, where you can simply add more if you find it takes too long. Now, be warned, the RCS modules require their own form of fuel, the RCS monopropellant tanks. You've got the regular one, the three meter one, and then the side mounted roundified monopropellant tank, which you will find I happen to use a lot. I like the roundified monopropellant, it just, it's neat. Next, we've also got the various engines. Now, there are a few engines that you can attach to the one meter versions. We have the liquid fuel engine here. This one does not have a gimbal on it, and it's gonna make me do the symmetry here, uh, but it is also the one with the most thrust. Now, there are a few things on the engines that you need to be aware of. First of all, engine max power and engine minimum power. Now, most engines, you can control their throttle. You can increase it or decrease it to a certain point. The engine max power is the maximum amount of thrust that that engine is capable of outputting. The engine minimum power is its minimum. This doesn't apply to most engines. However, the solid fuel rockets, if I can find uh, one, such as the Rocco Max solid fuel booster here, it's actually, you know, it doesn't say on the engine minimum power actually, go figure. But this engine cannot be shut down. It says that in the description there, engine cannot be shut down. So it burns at 300 all the time until it runs out of fuel. They can't be turned off. So bear that in mind. If you try to jettison one while it's burning, it's probably gonna go flying up into your craft and total the whole thing. We've also got the LV T45 liquid fuel engine. This engine is capable of slightly less thrust output. However, it does have a gimbal on it. And as you can see, it's just a little bit smaller on the engine side and it's got a little bit additional piece here. So again, a little bit less power, but it does have gimbal on it, which can be useful. We've also got the LV909, which weighs much less than the LVT45 and the LVT30, uh, but is also capable of significantly less power. Now, one other thing you're going to want to be aware of within the engine's description is the ISP. As for what the ISP stands for, I couldn't tell you actually, but think of it as fuel efficiency. The higher the number, the more thrust you're going to get for less 
fuel. So on the LVT30, you're looking at about 320 ISP at sea level, that's in the atmosphere, and 370 after you have left the atmosphere. The T45 is also 320 and 370, and the 909 has less efficiency in atmosphere, but slightly more outside with a 300 in and a 390 out. Now, there are a few differences. The Rockle Max mainsail, which is the primary three meter, which you're going to use also with the uh, three meter fuel tanks here if you really need to get a big load into orbit. Do, do try to remember that in the Kerbal Space Program, less is generally more. Uh, if you can do it with less, you're probably going to fly better. The uh, Rockle Max mainsail, as you can see, has much lower fuel efficiency. 280 at sea level, 330 in vacuum. However, it's also capable of a whopping 1500 thrust at maximum throttle. So yeah, that's a lot of output. But it's also heavy at a total mass of six. There's a lot of balances and weight values that you've gotta be aware of in here if you're gonna to want to go anywhere. There are a few other motors, the really tiny ones, the uh, this one, which is an engine for ants, apparently. I've never actually been able to use it for anything because its thrust is so ridiculously low. Not to mention the fact that its fuel efficiency is bupkis. Next, we also have the Rockle Max 2477, which I actually do use quite a bit. It's, it's a reliable little engine. They're side-mounted, and they consume a at least a respectable amount of fuel for a 20 output of thrust. We've also got the atomic rocket motor. This is an interesting one. Uh, it's good for certain situations. It's a bit heavy at 2.25. It weighs more than even the, the regular old one meter. But the advantage to the nuclear engine which is also part of one of its disadvantages, is the fact that in the atmosphere, its ISP is 220. So it's very low fuel efficiency in the atmosphere. It's only capable of outputting a maximum thrust of 60, but in vacuum, so in space, its ISP jumps up to 800. So you can get twice as much thrust out of the same amount of fuel that you would out of the LVT-30. Do bear in mind, it takes a significantly longer time to burn that fuel because you can only put out 60 maximum power at a time. Now, ISP relates directly to fuel consumption. So your engine will always put out the amount of maximum or minimum power that it is that you have the throttle currently set to. But depending on whether or not you're in vacuum or in atmosphere will determine the amount of fuel that the engine consumes to put out that amount of thrust. So if I were to, for instance, launch this craft right here, it would suck fuel like crazy and put out almost no thrust. But if I were to then put it in space, it would put out the exact same amount of thrust, but you would see it affecting the craft because in space you don't have to worry about dealing with the gravity of the planet. And it would consume almost no fuel. It would just kind of sip on your tanks there, which is quite useful, quite useful indeed. Uh, there are also variations of the fuel tanks. You've got little half tank sizes here. We've got the double long size tank here. And this also applies to the great big three meter tanks. We've got our little half tank, the regular tank, the uh, half half tank, <laughs> which actually I think is what this thing is, and then the ginormous orange tube of doom. And we've also got the jet engines, but we'll go over those when we actually decide to go over to that building, as well as the fuselages that only have fuel in them. Do not use these if you want to get into space with rockets. They only contain fuel, and if you look at the rocket engines, they require both liquid fuel and oxidizer. So while they do technically use the same fuel, the rocket engines require oxidizer as well, and won't go anywhere without it. There's also the separatron. Uh, these can be used rather interestingly with your separation stages to try to get things away from your craft if you really want them to just go away and get out of the way before you do things if they make you nervous. And they can make you nervous. You have every right to be nervous if they do. There is one more rocket here. 
He's a little bit of an interesting bugger. The Pteroidal Aerospike Rocket. This one was uh, originally a mod, but they did like it and installed it in the game eventually. You'll notice that he has some pretty good ISP here. Of all the other regular nuclear rocket engines, he's got the best ISP out of all of them, but again, slightly less throttle. His maximum output is only 175. Obviously, you cannot land on this thing. It just does not work. It will snap right off. But its ISP is a 388 in atmosphere and 390 out of it. So that's pretty good. So if you can get away with using these, you'll find their fuel efficiency makes your life much, much easier. All right, and that concludes the first episode. Thank you for joining me for my tutorial series on how to Kerbal Space Program. We went over engines, control, and your various command pods, as well as certain aspects of the interface. Next time, we're going to dive into some more advanced things, such as the various things you will find under structural, from the space duct tape, which is the strut connector, to how to use action groups, on your craft, and of course, the launch sequence. Thank you for joining me.